Good morning, Chehi family. I am so glad uh, that we have this opportunity to be together uh, for a few minutes this morning. And obviously, it's not the way that we would uh, like to be together. I wish that uh, we could be in person. In fact, uh, I had planned on being in chapel this morning in person, uh, not here sitting on my porch in Virginia. But I am glad uh, that we have the opportunity to be together. And I hope that you could uh, join in on the hymn sing last night. And I pray that that was an encouragement and a blessing to you. You know, this has been such a, a challenging year for all of us. And it's affected all of us in different ways. Um, I like to kind of think of this as a storm. Uh, but it's a storm in which we would say that not all of us have been impacted uh, in the same way. It, I've said it before like this, that we're all in the same storm, but we're not all in the same boat. We're all in the same storm, but not in the same boat. And in this storm, there's been all kinds of, of waves, uh, waves of disappointment at things that we've missed out on. I know I'm disappointed about not being at camp. I'm disappointed about not being able to see you, not being able to, to speak to you in chapel, to hang out together, to play Frisbee, uh, to have sing time in person together. Those things are disappointing. And I know... Uh, each of you have gone through disappointments, things that you've missed out on, things that you've lost. Uh, there's been waves of discouragement as this whole pandemic just sort of keeps going on. And when's it going to end? And when are we going to get back to normal? And there's frustration, there's fear. Uh, there's just all the things that, that we're, we're dealing with right now. And in this storm and all these waves that, that we go through, they have a way of beating down hope in our life. And, and so this morning, I want to talk about hope. And over these next couple of weeks that we'll be together uh, on Tuesdays, that uh, hope will be the theme that we talk about. Because God wants you to live with hope. God wants you to, to know and experience His living hope. And that's my prayer for you, that you would know and experience God's hope, even in the midst of the storm. And this storm that we're in is, is not the only storm that we'll be in in life. It's not the only storm that you'll be in in life. And in the midst of adversity and, and in the midst of, of, of the things that we go through, sometimes having hope and keeping hope is really hard. And hope seems elusive and difficult. And it seems like all the news that we get and all the information that comes in and the things that happen, the, those waves that keep coming, they just sort of seem to beat down hope. But God wants you to live with hope. God is a God who desires for his children to know and experience and live in his incredible hope. And so I want to share a little passage of scripture with you this morning from 2 Samuel uh, chapter 9. So if you have your Bible around or you know, pull it up on your phone, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 9. And I want us to consider the story of a man named Mephibosheth. And he's sort of a, a lesser known character in the Bible. He doesn't have a lot of information about him, but he has a fascinating story. And, and its story, I think, is one that, that we might be able to identify with, but also be encouraged by and learn from. So I want to look at Mephibosheth and in thinking about his life and think about the hope that God offers us. So uh, let's jump in 2 Samuel uh, chapter 9, and we'll begin with the first four verses. So 2 Samuel uh, chapter 9, and let's begin with verse 4. And David said, Is there still anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba, and they called him, and they called him to David. And the king said to him, Are you Ziba? And he said, I am your servant. And the king said, Is there not still someone of the house of Saul that I may show kindness the kindness of God to him. Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan. He is crippled in his feet. The king said to him, Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, He is in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, at Lo Debar. And so in these verses, we're, we're introduced to Mephibosheth, and we find out a little bit about his story and what's going on in his life, and, and we, we get introduced to this conversation where David is asking if there's anyone from the house of Saul for whom he could show kindness to. Now, right away, that's, that's sort of a, an interesting bit because Saul was David's predecessor. Saul was the first king of Israel, and God removed him from the throne. 
because of his disobedience and his unwillingness to follow God's leading and God's spirit. And so God anointed David long even before Samuel, or uh, God anointed David by the prophet Samuel long before Saul even uh, died and before he left the throne. And the tension between Saul and David was, well, we wouldn't even call it tension, right? Uh, Saul learned of David's popularity and also of God's choosing him to be the next king. And because of that, Saul hated David and Saul tried to kill David. Uh, so Saul, uh, you know, for years, uh, Saul hunted David mercilessly. And so there was a lot of tension between uh, Saul's family and David's family, obviously. And so we find this interesting, interesting bit of scripture here, which says that, that David wanted to show kindness to Saul, but it was for the sake of Jonathan, Saul's son, whom David and Jonathan were close friends. And so he calls in uh, this uh, servant from Saul's house named Ziba, and they find out that there is a descendant of Saul. In fact, it's Jonathan's son named Mephibosheth. And we, we're going to find that Mephibosheth is a man that in many ways is living a hopeless life, right? Mephibosheth is, he's the grandson of Saul, but uh, he, he has had a lot of challenges in life because he had to flee. His family had to flee when Saul died because usually when a new king took over that they would kill all of the potential threats or rivals. And Mephibosheth was just a, a young child, a baby, when, when this happened. And so Mephibosheth had something happen to him. He was dropped. He was being carried by a nanny, and he was dropped. And when he was dropped, he had a severe injury to his legs. And so Mephibosheth, for all of his life, is unable to walk. He is lame. And so Mephibosheth is sort of an exile he is living in a place called Lo Debar, and that place means no communication, no word, or no pasture. And so Lo Debar is very much a hopeless place, and Mephibosheth is very much living a hopeless life. Right? He is. He has had his family had to flee. He has suffered an injury that's marked him for all of his life, and he's living in a place called Lo Debar. That just sounds hopeless. And the name of Lodabar is a very hopeless place. No communication, no word, no pasture. And, you know, maybe you could say, I can identify with Mephibosheth a little bit. I, I, I get I get him. Like, my circumstances aren't the same as Mephibosheth's. Uh, I, I mean, I, my, my, my grandfather wasn't the king of Israel, and I wasn't dropped physically, and I didn't break my legs. But I, I understand. I, I feel like I'm living in Lodabar. I feel like I'm living in that hopeless place. The circumstances of life, the, the things that I've gone through have left me hopeless. And you know, for Mephibosheth, it, a lot of his suffering had to do with his circumstances. Circumstances that he had nothing to do with and no control over. He was dropped by a nanny, right? And sometimes, you know, our hopelessness just comes from our circumstances. The things that are going on in our lives, the things that are going on in our world, cause us to feel hopeless. And there aren't things that we had any control over, but they just keep coming like waves. And, and maybe you can say, I can identify with that. The, the circumstances of life, the, the things that I've missed out on, the things that have happened to me, maybe it's an illness that you're suffering with. Maybe it's a family situation. Maybe it's just all the disappointment and discouragement that's come with this season. You feel like the, the, the suffering that I'm going through is making hope difficult. And not only did Mephibosheth experience hopelessness and suffering because of his circumstances, but really it was the sinful actions of others. And in his case, his grandfather, Saul. Right? It, it, if Saul had been faithful to God, if Saul hadn't rebelled against God, then none of that would have ever happened. You know, And sometimes we go through situations in life where our lives are deeply affected by other people's sin. Other people's bad choices cause us to suffer. And that can cause us to feel hopeless. Right? Whether it's a family member or a coworker or a friend or someone that betrayed us or hurt us or somebody that did something to you that still has a consequence in your life. Or maybe like Mephibosheth, you're experiencing some of your suffering because of your own choices or consequences. We don't know all of his story, but he's choosing to live in this place called Lo Debar. Right? No pasture, no word, no communication. You know, sometimes we experience hopelessness not because of our circumstances and not because of something something else did to us, but we suffer hopelessness because of our own choices, our mistakes, our failures, 
And, and, and it kind of, we get stuck in this loop where making these mistakes, I made some bad decisions and I feel like it's cut off my hope for the future. And regardless of the cause, when we are hopeless and we feel stuck, it's a difficult place. Why? Because we need hope. God made us so that we need hope in our lives. And, and without hope, we can't really live the way that God wants us to live. And so we're going to see something really incredible happen. But then I want us to think about, well, what does that mean for us today? Notice verse 5. It says that King David sent and brought him from the house of Machir and the son of Amiel at Lodabar. And Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and paid homage. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Behold, I am your servant. And you have to imagine Mephibosheth is probably terrified because life has always gone bad for him. I mean, he was dropped as a baby. He's crippled. He lives in Lodabar. He, he not, is not certain if, if David wants to get rid of him. And so there had to be some, some great fear. I mean, you can just imagine that Mephibosheth's heart is pounding at this point, right? As he's wondering what and how this is going to go and why has he been brought before David? And he says, behold, I'm your your servant. And David said to him, do not fear. So David can see and sense his fear. And he says, don't fear for I'm going to show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. And I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your father, and you shall eat at my table always. And he paid homage and said, what is your servant that you should show regard for a dead dog such as I? Mephibosheth feels unworthy to be in David's presence. Right, he 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 doesn't understand. He he can't even comprehend why David would want to do this for him, right? and and his viewpoint of himself is at this point is so low. I'm just a dead dog from Lodabar. Why why would you want to do this for me? I, he his his identity has been forged through tragedy and through pain and through suffering. But notice what's going to happen. Notice David's response in verse 9. The king called Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, All that belong to Saul and to all his house I have given to your master's grandson. And you and your sons and your servants shall till the land for him and shall bring in the produce that your master's grandson may have bread to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, shall always eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then Ziba said to the king, according to all my lord, the king commands his servants, so your servant will do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table, like one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all who lived in Ziba's house became Mephibosheth's servants. So Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem, and for he always ate at the king's table. Now he was lame in both his feet. So we see this incredible thing happen where, where Mephibosheth is given this place of honor. He is invited to live as one of David's own sons and to eat at his table. And David makes sure that, that his family is going to be taken care of and that because he is lame and cannot farm or cannot produce for himself, that, that they, others will farm and till the land for him so that his family is taken care of. But he himself is going to live as one of David's own sons and eat at his own table, right? And to, to experience the very best. And so we see this incredible transformation. Now, this verse 13 reminds us that he's still lame, right? That there are, there are still consequences that in this life don't get fixed. And a lot of times when we think about, you know, having hope restored or experiencing hope, we think that if, if my circumstances all just get fixed, then things will be better. But it's not just about fixing his circumstances. He's still lame, but everything has changed. He's been invited to the king's table. He's invited to be a king, a son, really, of the king. And he lives life there the rest of his life. And he gets to experience hope again, right? There, there's hope again in Mephibosheth's life. The circumstances of his life have been overcome. The choices of others are no longer hanging over him. And even his own choices, right, the consequences of them, he's been set free. And so I want us to just think for a few minutes uh, uh, this morning about, okay, that, that's a great story. That, that's an awesome story for Mephibosheth. We feel good when we hear stories like that. You know, when someone who had experienced such injustice dropped as a baby and injured, having to flee because of the actions of his grandfather, Saul, it was not his fault. And then sort of getting stuck in this 
pattern and thinking of himself as a dead dog and living in Lodabar. And now he's living uh, in, David's, in David's palace. He is living as a son of the king. He's eating well. His family's taken care of. And, you know, those kind of stories make us feel good. Uh, we rejoice in that. We, we feel hopeful for that. But it, it can leave us with the question, well, what about me? I mean, that's great for him, but what about me? I don't have a King David to do that for me. There's no, there's no King David that's going to bring me into the palace. And, and we might be tempted to think that, but there's someone far greater than David who wants to do for you what David did for Mephibosheth, a son of David who was and is David's creator, Jesus came to us and for us. And he came to offer to us what David offered Mephibosheth, but only in a far deeper and greater way. Because we were stuck in hopelessness, the hopelessness of sin, the hopelessness of of our own sin, the hopelessness of the sin of others that impacts and affects us. And as such, we were cut off from God and cut off from a relationship with God. We were cut off from hope. But Jesus came to give us hope back. And he came to restore us into a relationship with himself and with the Father. And he came to make hope possible for us, for you and for me and for anyone, despite what you might be going through, despite the the storms, despite the waves of disappointment and discouragement, the waves of frustration, the waves of fear, the things that we go through in life. Jesus came to offer us hope. And I just want to point you to, to a couple areas real quickly. He came to offer you hope for the hurts that have happened to you, right? There's things that have just happened to you, whether it's the things that have happened to you because of this season that we've been going through with COVID, whether it's something that happened to you before this or even during this, something that somebody uh, has done to you or allowed that happen to you. Listen, the hurts that have happened to us just because of the circumstances of our life, God wants to take them and use them, right? Even for our good. Romans 8, 28 says that we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. That's an empowerful verse. It says, we know, Paul says, we know that God works for the good. He works all things for the good of those who love him and have been called according. He doesn't say all things are good. In fact, Paul would be the first person to admit all things are not good. But God can take the not good things and the circumstances of our life, and he can work in them for good. And so we can have hope because even in the circumstances of life that we don't like and that are not good and that are painful, we can have confidence as God's children that God is there with us in them and he's at work in them. So there's hurts for the things that have happened to us. There's hurt for the hope that we have suffered. I should, let me say that differently. I said there's hurt for the hope. There is hope for the hurt that we have suffered due to the things that others have done to us. And maybe somebody has sinned against you in a way that has hurt you deeply. A family relationship, abuse, someone that has done something to you, a friendship, a betrayal, something that somebody has done to you that has caused you to feel hopeless. And I want you to know that Jesus came to, to set you free from that hopelessness. He set you free because God is a God who heals our hurts and he bears our our suffering and our sorrow with us. And he sees and he knows and he cares and he offers you hope for that and his healing and his grace. But he also offers us hope for our own bad choices, our failures, our mistakes, our sin. He offers us his unconditional freedom and forgive. He offers us unconditional freedom and forgiveness. Right? He offers us to that when we come to him for salvation by faith, where he forgives our sin positionally past, present, and future. And he offers us that relationally as his children when we still sin and we still fall short. He says that if we confess our sins, first John chapter one, verse nine, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so we're, there, there is forgiveness and healing available. Your mistakes, your failures, your shortcomings, your sin are not a cause for hopelessness. It's not over. God hasn't forgotten you. God's not done with you. He wants to forgive you. He wants to restore you and he wants to use you. Listen, I know it's easy to lose hope sometimes in life. It's easy when life is difficult and painful and hard to feel hopeless. But I want you to know that Jesus entered our world and he experienced our hurt and our pain. And he knows, he knows what it's like to hurt. He knows what it's like to be betrayed. He knows what it's like to be mocked. 
He knows what it's like to be humiliated. He knows what it's like to be let down by those closest to you. He knows injustice and pain and suffering. But Jesus also knows victory. And so he offers you both his compassion and his empathy and his understanding. Hebrews says that we have a high priest who sympathizes with our weakness. But he doesn't just sympathize with our weakness. He was victorious over it. He defeated those things when he went to the cross and when he rose from the dead, when he stood up in Joseph's tomb in defiance of death, in defiance of sin, in defiance of the grave. He made possible not only the forgiveness of our sin and the salvation of our souls and for us to have a way to have a living relationship with God through him, to have a future and a hope with him, but he also made a way for us to experience hope right now in our lives. And I just want you to know that even though life may look hopeless or feel hopeless or seem hopeless, if Jesus is part of your life, you are never beyond hope. No matter what has happened to you, no matter what others have done to you, no matter what you have done, hope is possible and hope is available because hope is a person and his name is Jesus. And finding real hope begins by knowing and experiencing life in and through Jesus. And so that's my prayer for you today, that you would experience and know God's hope. We're going to continue to, to talk about hope and what it looks like and how we live it out and how we share it with others over the coming weeks. But I just want to leave you with a verse today uh, from Romans chapter 15. It was a verse that God brought to my mind this morning and wanted to share it with you. It says, uh, this is Paul's prayer uh, as he's writing to the to the to the church at Rome and, and he's wanting to encourage them and strengthen them. He says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Now, just listen to that. He says, may the God of hope, right? He says, our God is a God of hope, and may he fill you with joy and peace. Listen, in believing, right? It requires faith. It requires you to trust God. It requires you to, to take that step. If, if you want to experience God's hope, you've got to take that step of faith and saying, my life looks hopeless, it feels hopeless, there's no hope around me, but I'm going to look up and see my Savior and my God. He's the God of hope. And that in believing, we can experience His hope and His joy and His peace. And He says that by the power of the Spirit, supernaturally, right, God will help you to abound in hope. We don't have to make ourselves hopeful. We don't have to try to feel hopeful. We don't have to try to be hopeful. We can simply go to God, the God of hope, and experience his living hope in our lives. And so that's my prayer for you today, that the God of hope would fill you and that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you would abound in hope today. If there's a way that I can pray for you or encourage you, or uh, please reach out. Don't hesitate to contact me or leave a message here. Or, uh, let us know. Uh, how uh, we as the Chehi family can be praying for you. We love you, and I look forward to being uh, with you again next Tuesday. God bless you. Have a great day.